Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Amit. I've been programming for quite a few years now. Uh, recently, I've been playing around with Rust. I find it to be an interesting language. So I've built some internal tools and stuff on Rust. Uh, so I'm going to share the function programming features in Rust. Uh, before I start, like, how many of you are already familiar with Rust? OK, it's a few. So this is going to be a basic introduction to Rust as a function programming language. Uh, and to set the expectations, um, so if you look at the programming languages spectrum, so you have all the Java, uh, C++, Python on one side, if you compare the function programming aspects. And you have Haskell on the right, right and Agda and other things on far right. right? So Rust is somewhere in between. Um, <clears throat> okay. So let's start with what is function programming. I, I guess all of you know it probably better than me. Uh, but different people have slightly different idea about what functional programming is, right? Um, so let me just give a quick uh, recap of what I think are the key uh, aspects of functional programming languages. So it's pure functions and values. Functions only transform values from one to another. And the key feature of a functional programming language is composition. So if you look at it, the core of FP and category theory is how we can compose things in a principled way. Um, and this helps us reason about our programs and um, you know, that stuff. Um, so it's kind of like building things using Lego blocks. Um, so, it, uh, so there are no side effects. It's clear how you can build things, and it's easy to break it apart and recompose things. And the same rules apply if you're building something small or you're building something complex, so which is a nice property. Um, so let's now look at Rust. So Rust was designed as a system programming language. And over the years, it has become popular. I think the last couple of years, it was voted as the most loud language in Stack Overflow. Um, so why should you learn a new language? So I like this quote from Alan Perlis. And I think Rust does influence the way we think about programming. So it's, it's good to learn on its own right. Um, so if you look at the official Rust programming language website, these are, the, these are the three goals that are mentioned for Rust. So the primary one is reliability uh, and performance. So we had languages like C++ and C for system programming languages for a long time, but they were not safe, right? So uh, it had issues with memories and thread safety um, and stuff like that. And R Rust has a rich type system that addresses that problem. And the, Unique thing about Rust is it provides these two without sacrificing the productivity. So when you code in Rust, it gives you a feeling of writing in a high-level language. Um, we'll see examples later. So it's based on the zero overhead or zero cost abstractions from C++, which is what you don't use, you don't pay for. And uh, if you do use something, you couldn't hand code any better. This might seem obvious, but if you have used any programming language, you know this is not true. So if you use like the higher level abstractions, there is generally a performance cost. And um, if you want to optimize performance, you generally have to go out of the way and write non-idiomatic code. But it is not true in Rust. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the debate of static versus dynamic typing. Uh, I'll just say that in Rust compiler is your front. You might have to spend more time to make your program compile, but once it compiles, it generally works. Um, so the key features, Rust is statically typed. Uh, it has type inference. And the unique features of Rust are it's based on an idea of linear types. It has an ownership model, which is based on this, and region-based memory management. Just together, these two features gives Rust the memory safety that I talked about earlier. So it's free from data races. Um, and it does not have a garbage collector. So there is no runtime cost associated with it. Um, yeah. So let's now dive into some Rust code. So the rest of the talk, I'm just going through a lot of code, just to give you a taste about how it looks like and to motivate you to look into Rust. Uh, so first, let's start with ownership model. So you need to understand a little bit about this uh, before we go into functional language features. Um, so in Rust, variables are immutable by default. So if you define a variable and then try to reassign the value to it, uh, the compiler will throw an error. And Rust has one of the best compiler errors around. So Elm is only the other language that I've, I've seen which has good compiler errors. So it clearly tells you what the problem is. You're trying to assign to immutable variable and where the problem is. Uh, it also tells you, generally, it also gives you a suggestion on how you can fix this. Um, so you can fix this problem by making 
the variables mutable. So, OK, let's look at another piece of code. So here I'm assigning a string hello to a variable x. And I also have an alias to it. I assign y also to x and try to print it. So I'm not modifying anything. So this works in almost all the mainstream languages. But this fails in Rust because of the ownership model. So in Rust, every value has a single owner, which is a variable. Um, so in line three, when we, re when we assigned x to y, it also moves the ownership to y. Now y is the owner. So in line four, you cannot access x anymore. So that's what the compiler is telling us. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions on a particular slide or something, stop me and ask any, any time. Um, and the reason Rust does not have garbage collector is because every value has a single owner. Once the variable goes out of scope, it can just clean, clear the value. So the uh, value x is dropped uh, once you reach line 5, because it, x is out of scope now. Uh, and here again, the compiler gives you a clear um, error. It says when the value is moved. Uh, and it, it also tells that um, the value is moved because the type does not implement a copy trait. So trait is kind of um, trait is similar to type classes in Haskell. So we'll see traits later. Uh, so the way you solve this problem, uh, one way to solve this problem, um, is to clone the value. So you create two different values. They have two different owners, so everything works. Um, you can also, if the type implements copy trait, it will also work. So intuitively, it's something that can be uh, allocated in stacks. So it's kind of cheap to copy, like primitive integers. So it is fine to um, reassign variables and use it. Um, so we all know that mutability is bad, right? But what is really bad is shared mutable state. And in Rust, you cannot have shared mutable state. The compiler guarantees that. Uh, so there are some specific types that uh, you, you can use to explicitly demand shared mutable state, but otherwise, it's not possible. Uh, so let's look at a function. So this is how we define functions in Rust, using the fn keyword. Uh, the function name, it takes in a string and returns a string. Um, and what I'm doing here is mutating the um, the parameter that's passed in and returning it. So this is considered a bad practice even in imperative languages, right? Uh, but it's kind of fine in Rust because once you call this function, the function takes ownership of the variable. So you cannot access that variable anymore. So this is totally safe in Rust. Even if you call it across multiple threads, it's fine. So this is a pure function. So if you call it with the same parameter, it always returns the same result. So this is an interesting way to uh, so in functional programming languages, we have this persistent data structures to, uh, to, to make our data structures immutable, right? So this is a way to you, uh, do the same thing in Rust. The, the caller does not know that uh, you, it is getting the same uh, value. <clears throat> um, but sometimes uh, we want to keep ownership. We, we don't want to give ownership to functions. For example, I'm calling a read-only function, let's say length, and I, I still want to have access to that value after that call. Or if you see in line eight, I'm printing the function, uh, printing a, va uh, a variable, I, I still want to keep ownership after printing something, right? Um, so for that, Rust has references. So references are like references in C++. Uh, you use an ampersand um, to say that it's a reference. Um, and if you use a reference, the function does not take ownership. It just borrows the variable. And once the function is done, the outer function still has access to that variable. And it is totally type safe, and Rust will track the lifetime and all that. So you cannot, so references are always valid uh, in Rust. You can also have mutable references um, using the mute keyword. So just to give an overview, uh, so every value has single owner, and when the owner goes out of scope, the value is dropped. And you can either have a mutable reference or any number of immutable reference. You cannot have both. And this is what guarantees that uh, the memory safety and no data erases in Rust. Uh, references also have lifetimes. Uh, I'm not going to cover lifetimes in this talk. OK, now let's look at functional programming aspects of Rust. So Rust has all the basic types that you'd expect. It's, it's boring. Uh, let's look at algebraic data types, how you can define your types and compose them. Right? That, that's what is more interesting. 
Um, so one way to look at types is by the number of inhabitants. So in Rust, you can create a type with no values um, using the enum keyword. So enum is like a data constructor in Haskell. So on the right side, you see the equivalent Haskell code. So I define an enum. The type name is white. It does not have any variant inside. So you cannot instantiate this type. Uh, so this is just use, useful in some special cases, like if you have a function that does not return, uh, you can use this type. There are cases where it is useful. More useful is something which has one value, uh, which is called unit in most languages. Some languages call it void to confuse people. But um, so you can define unit using, again, enum, which is very similar to how you do it in Haskell. Uh, or Rust has a built-in unit type. So if a function does not return, I mean, uh, like a, if you want to define a function like a procedure, it, it generally returns the unit type. Uh, if you want two types, so enum is a sum type. So it's a, it's a sum of the variants that you define. Again, very similar to Haskell, only the syntax is different. So this is isomorphic to Boolean. Um, and it can take type parameters. So here, option is a type constructor uh, that takes in a type parameter and creates some A or none. It's again, equivalent thing in Haskell is a maybe. And you can define either in Rust. Uh, in standard library, it's called result. Otherwise, it's the same. It, it behaves like an either. Um, and product types, uh, you can define either using a tuple, which is just a comma separated value of types, or a struct. The only difference from a type point of view is that in struct, you can uh, give names to the constituents. Uh, it's like in any language. Um, yeah. And let's try to define a recursive type. Um, this is the basic, the most basic type, right? So you, we, we try to create a list of A's, which is either nil or cons of A and a list of A. This is how we define it in any language. Um, but this doesn't work in Rust because, like I said, Rust's primary focus is performance and safety. So Ru the Rust compiler has to know the, uh, the size of every type that you define. So it cannot figure out the type of this because it's like, <laughs> It has, it's a recursive type, so it has in infinite size. But again, the compiler tells you how to fix this. So there are ways to, um, there are some special types that you can use to uh, say that. So what we really want is this list is a pointer, right? It's like a, uh, something that's allocated on the heap. So in Rust, you have to explicitly mention that using one of these smart pointers. So box just tells the compiler that this is something that has to be allocated in heap. So RC is a reference counted um, object. So if you want to share and et cetera, so, or you can use a reference. So these are the three ways in which you can fix this. Um, so the simplest one is to use a box, and then it behaves exactly like uh, how you define it in Has Haskell. OK, so once you have algebraic data types, you also it, it's nice to have pattern matching to get things out of the types, and Rust has like really good pattern matching support. Things work as you would expect. So uh, let's say I have a struct with a um, person with a name and an address, and I have a value of that type. I can pattern match and get things out. And in Rust, the pattern matching is, has to be exhaustive, otherwise you get a compiler error. So, so again, it's part of the guarantees um, that there are no runtime exceptions. It's always caught by the compiler. <coughs> And pattern matching can be complicated. You can have conditions, ranges, and all that stuff. OK, so let's look at traits. So traits are informally a set of methods that you can attach to a type. So it's a way to achieve ad hoc polymorphism. Um, and like I said, it's, it's similar to type classes in Haskell. Um, so we saw clone earlier. So it is a trait that is defined in the standard library. So you define a trait by using the trait keyword. Um, and you can have many methods in it. It's just functions. So it has only one function, which takes a value of the implementing type and returns that type. So I can implement clone for any of my struct that I create um, by using this syntax. So implement clone for this. Again, kind of similar to how you do it in Haskell. Just the names are different. Um, so yeah, it just takes um, a value of that 
type and returns self. So I could have said it returns my struct, it's equivalent. Um, slightly more interesting example, uh, all the operators, well, most of the operators in Rust are implemented using traits. So if you want your type to support some operators, you can just implement a particular trait and get that feature. Um, so in this case, I have a struct point, and I want to implement um, add operator for that. Um, so again, it's the same syntax. Uh, now this trait is um, also has a type parameter, so I need to provide that. And the add function just adds the uh, coordinates respectively, right? So it's fairly simple. And once you have that, you can just add point structs as you would do. So this might also look similar to interfaces in Java, uh, but it's not, because you can define a trait and implement that trait on an already existing uh, struct, like something from standard library, for example. So it's like more close to Haskell. And it has some coherence rules to avoid name collision and all that stuff. Um, so for example, here I have a time duration trait, with just one fun function called days. And I can implement that for integer and um, I just return a duration object of that type. And once I have that, I can like write code like this. I can just say, add three days to this date, okay? So this will work as long as this trait is in scope. And this helps us to build kind of type safe DSLs uh, in a very good way. Okay, so finally, let's look at functions in Rust. Um, so you, can, you define functions using the fn keyword. And this is one way to define factorial. You can, again, pattern match. You can pattern match on almost anything in Rust. So uh, we can pattern match on the integer with 0 or 1. I return 1, otherwise recursively call this. Uh, but yeah, we would like to use some combinators to implement this, right? Um, so before going to that, we need closures. Um, Rust has like proper support for closures. The only difference is instead of lambda a, you use this vertical bars. I think it got the idea from Ruby. I'm not a big fan of this syntax. But anyway, other, apart from the syntax, it works uh, similar to, uh, similar as you would expect. So this is a closure that takes one argument. You can take a closure with two arguments. Uh, closure also captures the environment. So um, yeah, there are no restrictions. So it can also change the environment, but then you have to explicitly uh, mention that this closure is mutable and stuff like that. And if your closure does not take any argument, you can just use this, this notation, just vertical bars with no arguments. Uh, so once we have that, we can use fold. So, so we can say factorial is just um, folding or multiplication on the range of uh, numbers from one to n, right? Uh, and if you remember, all the operators are defined in traits, so I could also do this. So because multiplication operation is a trait, I can directly mention the function here, uh, which is multiplication. So it's kind of cool. And well, you can also use a built-in function like product. And this is like kind of very close to how you do it in Haskell. So let's look at higher order functions now. Um, let's say you want to define a function apply, which takes a function and applies it on an argument. So the Implementation is simple, like if you look at line three, uh, it's just calling the function on that argument. The only thing we need more, uh, is how to specify the function type. So the function type is specified using this format. Um, so it's not like A to B in, uh, as you do in Haskell, it's F and A to B, and we'll see why soon. Um, so this is a, a syntax in Rust where you can uh, specify the type constraints after um, the function definition using a where clause. You could, you could also do this when we define the um, type parameters here. So I can say apply f colon, the same thing there. But this is a much more cleaner way. And once you do that, you can call apply with either a function or a closure. So it works. Um, so like I said, um, the function trait, the, the fn is a trait. It's not really a trait. It's actually a family of traits because Functions can take multiple arguments. And to complicate things further, there are there's not one, but three traits in Rust uh, that stands for functions. So this makes abstracting or functions a little tricky in Rust. These are like some of the rough edges. 
uh, when you go into functional programming. Uh, but most of the time, you'll, y you can get away with using fn. So, but if your function takes mu supports mutable closures, then you have to use fn mute and other things. I'm, I'm not going into detail of this. Um, so let's see how, let, let's define one more function to see how the ownership model and other things come in play when you try to define something in pure functional way. Uh, so let's try to define compose. So compose takes two functions f and g, and then g after f uh, just calls f first and then g, right? So again, implementation is fairly trivial. So you take, uh, you, we have to return a function, so it returns a closure at this line. Uh, it calls f on that first and then g. Okay, the type parameters are a little more complicated, but based on what we learned, f is just a function from x to y, g is a function from y to z, and what we want to return is a function from x to z. But this doesn't, this is what you would normally expect, but this doesn't compile. So if you remember some slides back, Rust needs to know the size of everything. So what we are returning is a trait, and Rust does not know what's the size, because the implementing type could be different. Um, so if you remember, one way to fix this is to use something like a box. But because this is like a common thing that you would do, Rust has a special syntax for it. Uh, so you can say, what this function returns is an implementation of this trait, not the trait itself. Um, this works, uh, but we still have problems because of ownership. Uh, again, the compiler errors are um, compiler errors will guide you to fix this, so it's not something that you have to like keep it on your head. But here, uh, compose takes in f and g, so compose owns these values. Functions are values, right? Um, and after this line, after the function is over, f and g will be dropped. But we are returning a closure, which will be called sometime later, right? So it's a problem. So that's why it's, it complains. So we need to move the ownership of this function to the closure, which can be done using the move keyword. So these are some of the things that you need to take care when you're I mean, when you're doing functional programming in Rust. So, but it's fine because like it's both good and bad. It's fine because the compiler guides you to actually fix this. Uh, and this is generally a problem when you define things, but when you use it, it's much cleaner. So this is how you, you use an iterator, for example. It's like, it's, I mean, it looks nice. Let's see one final example, uh, quicksort. So this is a functional implementation of quicksort. Uh, it takes in a list of things, and the list, list has to be orderable. So again, it's a type constraint. Um, we partition based on some pivot, and then quicksort. <laughs> Uh, both halves and then merge it, right? This is almost similar to how we do it in Haskell, except that Rust does not have list comprehension, so it's a few more lines longer, otherwise it's the same. Uh, and again, because it's, because it's purely functional, if you want to make it parallel, you just need to change one line, um, which is when we sort the halves, right? So you can say sort these halves in parallel and everything just works. Um, <laughs> So, to sum up, is Rust a good functional programming language? Um, so it has uh, safe functions, right? You don't get any runtime errors or runtime exceptions or any such thing. So pattern matching has to be exhaustive. So it, it makes sure that most of the errors are caught at compile time, which is good. It has algebraic data types. Uh, it prefers immutable uh, values, though you can do mutable programming, um, mutable things. Um, higher order functions are there, but again, you have to always think about ownership and lifetimes and stuff. Lifetimes I haven't talked about, so that's another thing that you have to think about. Um, and advanced functional abstractions, like if you want to define a functor or a monad um, trait, it's, a, it's currently impossible in Rust because Rust does not have higher kind of types. Uh, there is an RFC to introduce a feature called associated type constructor which has the same power, but it's, it's a different mechanism. So you have to understand that mechanism if you want to like build higher order abstractions. So most of the I mean, uh, libraries currently get around this problem because Rust has macros. So using macros, you can define list comprehensions and everything else, but it's not, uh, yeah, it's not very nice. And Rust is not a functional language, so functions are not pure. So you have to make sure, as a programmer, to follow some convention and have a functional core and imperative shell model 
right? So make sure that um, functions are pure. Um, so should I use Rust? I don't know. So there are a lot of factors that you need to consider, right? So I mean, in some conferences, people say, I mean, this is the best thing. You know, you should start using it from tomorrow. But there are like every problem is different, so it totally depends on you. So one framework, yeah, one thing you need to consider is the domain. So Rust is not Rust is a mature language, but it does not have libraries like mature libraries on every domain. So these are some domains that the Rust language officially recommends where it is strong. So there is already like a lot of networking libraries, uh, especially in the service mesh area that's written in Rust and in production, and WebAssembly is another area. Like command line ap applications or embedded is like obviously good areas for Rust, but for web application development, there are some libraries, but they are not mature yet. So you need to make sure uh, you have m mature libraries uh, on your domain, and like you need to consider all the other things. Uh, so these are some of the factors that I mentioned, but you, you you may have to consider more like functional programming ease of learning, community performance, and all that. So this is how I would map Java or C++ there. And if I look at Rust, uh, Rust is better in functional programming and performance in Java. So if you're coming from one of those languages, it's an easier choice, I think, except for the maturity aspect. So you need to be careful about whether it has the uh, mature libraries and all that stuff. But otherwise, um, it's kind of an easy choice, in my opinion. Uh, but if you're coming from Haskell, it's definitely not on par with Haskell on functional programming. So if you're already doing Haskell um, and functional programming, there's probably no reason to use Rust, except if you want to write some part of your program to improve performance. So currently, you would use C, C++, which is not safe. If you're using Rust, you can almost follow the same paradigm as you're doing in Haskell, and it's safe. So that's probably the only reason you would um, you would look at Rust. Um, so I just wanted to leave you with this thought that um, it's good to learn new tools because the tools shapes our thinking. And I think Rust has some good ideas. It makes some of the things explicit that we as programmers were kind of ignoring, which is actually a good thing for us uh, to learn. Um, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much.